Okay, so um, this lecture is about black holes. Um, at least the first half of the lecture is about black holes. There's a second half of the lecture. I'm going to actually pause for a few minutes in this lecture and give everybody a chance to rest, take a deep breath. Then we're going to get a second lecture um, on the evolution of the universe and the age of the universe and how we determine that, determine that in modern cosmology. But I did want to take some time to talk a little bit about just black holes because that's a topic that at least a good fraction of you just have some interest in. You've heard about them before. You want to know what black holes are. And please, while I'm giving this lecture, I really hope people will raise their hand and ask questions about stuff. Um, if, you, if there's something I don't answer or there are questions you have, please, answer, please ask them. So what are black holes? So black holes are objects that are so massive and so dense that light cannot even escape their gravitational tug. And the reason why they're black holes is because any light that might be emitted by objects anywhere near them or within a certain radius can never escape from that radius. So what this means is nothing ever gets out. And so they're not shining in any way um, within this certain region. At least, at least that's the standard scenario. So that when you see them from, from a distance, there's no light be coming from them. The only way you can detect them by a light uh, by a studies that have to do with electromagnetic radiation is there's stuff around them that's far enough away from them that it's not sucked into the black hole, but it's close enough that they're within the strong gravitational tug that it's, get, that it's gotten heat up, heated up in some way so that it's glowing, um, maybe in X-ray or maybe in gamma rays or something like that, and you can detect it that way. Okay. Now, the idea behind this, this the basic idea behind what a black hole is, it's actually fairly simple if you think about it in terms of escape velocity. So what is escape velocity? Escape velocity is the speed with which you have to travel in order to escape a planet or some gravitational object. So for example, imagine that you've got a tennis ball and you're on Earth and you throw the tennis ball up. The tennis ball is going to go up and come back down. The faster you throw the tennis ball, the farther up it's going to go before it turns back down. Right? But you can envision that if you threw that tennis ball hard enough, fast enough, if you launched it with a high enough speed, then it would escape the gravitational tug of the Earth altogether and fly off. And in fact, that's what rockets do. You know, we're, there's a space shuttle launch today, and the idea with the space shuttle launch is you want to get it going fast enough so that it escapes the gravitational tug of the Earth and begin, can begin orbiting around the Earth at some larger distance. If it went even faster, it would escape the Earth altogether and just keep going. Okay? So that's the idea of escape velocity. For the Earth, it's about 7 miles a second. So you've got to be traveling at something like 7 miles a second in order to escape the Earth. All right? Now, imagine that the Earth was more massive. The more massive the Earth is, the faster that escape velocity is going to be. The more massive and more dense the planet or star is, higher that escape velocity is. Now, so imagine you had an object that was so massive that, that the escape velocity was larger than that of light. So 7 miles a second is the escape velocity of the Earth. 186,000 miles a second is the velocity of light. So the velocity of light is much, much higher than the escape velocity of the Earth, but you could just do this thought experiment that maybe you could have objects that are so dense that even light couldn't escape now, as far as we know, the first idea that there couldn't be such a thing like a black hole was actually proposed quite a long time ago, um, 1784, a guy named John Mitchell talked about this idea. Mitchell was um, a scholar, really sort of a, sort of a jack-of-all-trades type of scholar. He, I guess he was technically a geologist, but he taught Hebrew, he taught Greek. He was a very advanced, um, just sort of thinker. Um, and, you know, he met with people like Benjamin Franklin. Uh, you know, he, he met with the, the scholars of the day. So he's a pretty prominent person, even though most of us, most of us haven't heard of him uh, today. And that's really because he wasn't very interested in popularizing his ideas. You know, he just kind of did his thing and wrote his books and did whatever. Uh, but what he did is he realized that theoretically it would be possible to have these objects that were so massive that light couldn't escape them, that 
that their escape velocity was larger than that of light. And remember, I talked to you that around this time in the 1700s, we had some reasonable idea of what the speed of light was. If you recall, Ulmer had done, this, done these experiments with the moon, moons of Jupiter and used that to estimate the speed of light. So we had a pretty good idea of what the speed of light was. And so he said, well, you know, if it's moving at a finite speed, then maybe gravity could, could stop it. Um, so he called these things dark stars. They weren't called black holes. Um, and most people at the time thought that, well, okay, maybe that's in principle possible, but it's probably physically impossible for such a thing to exist. It just seems so bizarre. I mean, why would anything like that exist? Um, but he did suggest an idea that you could look for this. If it just so happened that you had one of these dark stars and there was a normal star near it, you could study the, or the normal star going around it. And if it was going around really, really fast, you could figure out, you could infer from that orbit how massive this dark star was, and therefore detect it. Okay? And interestingly, that's one of the methods that we use today to infer the existence of black holes. And in fact, um, I'll flash forward uh, you know, to today. Um, one of the most glaring examples of the existence of a black hole is, is found from stunning the orbits of stars. And in fact, there's a black hole that we're very confident exists in the center of our own galaxy that's extremely massive. It's something like four million times the mass of the sun. So it's a super massive black hole that lives at the very heart of our galaxy. And uh, we study it, astronomers study it, by uh, looking at stars orbiting around it. So what this is, is this is a movie uh, that's been made by taking observations over about 10 years' time of the center of our galaxy. And all of these glowing dots here are stars. They're stars that exist in the center of our galaxy. And this number that's up in the upper left corner of the plot is the year. So you can see that it starts in 1995 and then progresses to 2010. And as it progresses to 2010, you can see the stars are orbiting around. The stars are going around the center of the galaxy. And by studying the orbits of these stars and how they whip around, you can figure out the mass of that thing that's sitting in the middle. And it turns out it has to be extremely massive, and we don't see a star associated with it. Um, now, let me impress upon you how ridiculous this movie is. Okay, So what you're watching is, first of all, you're watching stars move over the course of about 15 years. And we think of stars, right, we think of stars in the sky as being fixed forever. You know, the sky that we look at is not that much different than it was a thousand years ago. You know, that's what we think of the stars as sort of eternal things, at least on the time scales of humans. The reason why we see these stars moving over the course of 15 years is they're just moving so damn fast. Okay, they're moving really, really fast. And they're traveling huge distances for us to be able to see them all the way at the center of the galaxy over the course of 10 years. So watch, for example, this one right here. You see this one that's in green? It approaches the center of the, the galaxy, this, this central black hole. And when it gets really close, it's going to whip around to this one. You see that really? So that happens when you have something orbiting around an object that's very massive. And in fact, you can see this is evidence of Kepler's law, really. So remember, one of Kepler's laws was you get really close to the thing you're orbiting around, you go fast. When you're far away from the thing that's orbiting around, you go slow. So you have this kind of whipping. There you see it. You can watch it in this movie over the course of a few years that the star is doing that. And so because they have all of these orbits for all of these stars in the center of the galaxy, um, we can determine the mass of that central object extremely well. And the mass that's required to make all these stars orbit around like they do is something like 4 million times the mass of the sun. Yeah. Is that its actual orbit, or is this black hole changing its pattern to look at that? So the question is, is that its actual orbit, or is the black hole changing its pattern in some way? So we think that the black hole is t completely governing its orbit. And so we think that in the past, this star, for example, has gone around a few times. So it's not like it's just coming in for the first time and then being deflected by the black hole. I think that's what you're asking. We think that these things have been there, the black hole has been there a long enough time that these stars have gone around it a few times, or many, many times. Because again, this, it's gone around it once almost in about 15 years, and the galaxy is you know, 10 billion years old. So 
we think this has been going on for a while. Whatever happened at the center of the galaxy probably hasn't been exactly like that for 10 billion years, but it's still a long time compared to 15 years that these orbits are taking to go around. Yeah? Are all galaxies governed by black holes? We believe now that almost all galaxies should have a black hole at the very center that's supermassive. You asked the, the question you asked was, all our galaxies governed by a black hole? So let me clarify that a little bit. It turns out that the amount, even though this black hole is super duper massive, if you step out a little bit, the total mass in stars dwarfs that black hole. So the total mass of the galaxy itself is something like 10 billion, 30 billion times the mass of the sun. This is 4 million times the mass of the sun. Okay, so you're talking about factors of more than 1,000 in total mass. So even though this black hole is very massive, it's very small compared to the total mass of the galaxy itself. It does dominate what's going on in the very, very center here. Um, so that's where things dominate. Any other questions? Yeah? Um, was that the beginning of the galaxy? That's an excellent question. Was the formation of this supermassive black hole the beginning of the galaxy? Is it like a seed that all galaxies grow around? That's a topic of current research. So some people think yes. Some people think that those black holes have basically been there from the beginning, and they play a really fundamental role in making the galaxy you know, look the way it does and behave the way it does. But we don't know for sure, and that's, like I say, a topic of current research. Yeah. Is it possible that there's a black hole in the center of the universe Well, the question is, 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 is it possible that there's like some, on much larger scales, this super black hole that's at the center of the universe itself? Um, so. As far as we know, the universe doesn't have a center, per se. So remember, everything is the center, uh, because everything is expanding away from everything else. So as far as we understand it now, um, the, the universe doesn't have a center, and so it, wouldn't, it doesn't really gel within our current understanding of how the universe works, that there would be a black hole at, in any special place. One interesting idea, though, is that the universe itself is a black hole, <laughs> in the sense that light can't escape it. So it's like we're all inside this mega black hole. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about your balloon analogy about the universe being like the surface of the balloon. Mm -hmm. What's inside? Oh, okay. So you're asking, I gave this balloon analogy before that the universe is like a surface of a balloon. And the balloon is blowing up. And you could, that's one way to think about the expansion of the universe. And the question is, what's inside the balloon? Um, so unfortunately, um, that's kind of where the analogy breaks down, that there's no, there is no inside of the balloon. Um, it, it's, it's as if, um, it's like if we were two-dimensional creatures living on the surface of the, of the balloon, that is the universe itself. And this third dimension that we think of that it's expanding into or whatever, it's kind of, um, is not real. It's just a mathematical construct that allows us to explain how the universe expands. So, Unfortunately, there is no simple analogy. I can't keep going with that analogy. It's just, that's why, I'm, that's why you constantly have to reach for multiple analogies. That's why we do the raisin bread analogy and the surface of the balloon analogy and other analogies, because there's not one analogy that you're familiar with in your day-to-day -day life that actually encapsulates what we think is actually going on with the expansion. Yes? Uh, how do the black holes at the center of galaxies interact when you collide how do black holes at the centers of galaxies interact when they collide? So we think that it becomes very interesting when they collide. Um, one of the things that I'll tell you about in a few minutes is that we think that around some of these black holes, there are, there's a lot of energy coming out. And these are objects called quasars. Um, and we think, for example, as two galaxies merge, the black holes at their centers will eventually begin to spiral around each other. And in that process, you might have a double quasar. Um, and then as they get closer and closer together, eventually those black holes will merge. And when those black holes merge, the mass of the black hole will be the mass of the first black hole plus the mass of the second black hole will make a new black hole that's basically that, the sum of those masses into one object. So that's what happens when they merge. And the, um, the process by which they merge is actually very interesting and, again, a topic of much um, research today because you really have to do the general relativistic calculation very accurately to understand how uh, black holes spiral together. And um, there are a lot of teams of researchers who are investing a lot of supercomputer time figuring out how to actually do that correctly. 
Um, yeah, and again, that's a topic of current research. So everybody in here is asking great questions because you're basically right to the cutting edge of the field like that. And I can't give you the answer to everything. Um, so let me back up a little bit and talk more about the history of black holes. Um, so, like I said, uh, John Mitchell in 1794 is the first that we know of to suggest this idea. Um, in 1796, this mathematician named Laplace, who some of you may have heard of, um, promoted the same idea. Um, but this idea really never gained a lot of traction because certainly by that time, the idea had propagated through the community that light, in fact, was a wave. And since light was a wave, it didn't have mass. So it didn't have mass. It didn't react to gravity. And so maybe this didn't happen. So even though um, it has a speed, the idea was, well, yeah, but, but gravity only affects things with mass, and therefore it shouldn't affect light, because light is massive. Okay. Um, now, in 1915, Einstein showed uh, that this isn't exactly true, that what gravity does, it's really what's happening with gravity is it's bending space itself. And if space gets warped, that means if something is traveling through that space, whether or not it's massless, it will still get bent by the curved space. And pretty soon after Einstein published his, um, his theory in 1915, uh, this guy named Carl Schwarzschild uh, showed that black holes in you know, a general relativistic sense, should, could exist. So the same idea is, and you know, the way you think about that is imagine that you have um, you know, a bowling ball and a mattress that curves the mattress down, and you think that the way that mattress curves is a way to think about curved space. Imagine the bowling ball gets heavier and heavier and heavier, the mattress is bent more and more and more, and if it's bent enough, it doesn't matter how fast that light wave is going by that bend of the mattress, it doesn't come out, it just goes in, and it doesn't come back out the other side. Um, so, um, now, until the 1970s, even though this theoretical idea that there could be a black hole uh, was around, until about the 1970s, most physicists actually thought that, even though it was theoretically possible that such things could exist, that it was just kind of like an artifact of the theory. That, yeah, in principle, if you had something that was this dense and this massive, you could have these black holes, but there was no reason to think that they actually existed in nature. Um, but eventually, um, you know, it was come to under, people came to understand the fact that they actually did exist. And uh, the existence of black holes, um, you know, the fact that there, there should be some objects that are collapsing that eventually do turn into black holes was one of the things that uh, made Stephen Hawking famous, and he did this work with Roger Penrose. Some of you who sort of are follow the sort of science uh, collecting card, you know, collect baseball cards like you collect scientists, uh, collect scientists like you collect baseball cards. I don't know how to say that right. Uh, you've probably heard of Stephen Hawking, and maybe some of you have heard of Roger Penrose. He's a sort of famous physicist, mathematician. And one of the things that, one of their sort of claims to fame back in their early years was working on black holes and showing that they had to exist. The term black hole actually wasn't, was coined by a physicist named, physicist named John Wheeler, um, and he actually used them first in a public lecture um, when he was just talking to the public trying to describe this idea. So it really wasn't until well after that their existence was predicted that this phrase black hole was coined. And, uh, you know, these phrases are, I think, are important because they capture, you know, people's imagination about what, how interesting these objects are. So the way black holes form, we think in a, in a normal sense, is they form at the deaths of very massive stars. So remember, at, at the ends of the lives of, of certain massive stars, they end their lives in these supernova explosions. And then their central regions get super, super dense. So one of the things that's left behind uh, after, these after this collapse process has ended are extremely dense objects. And some objects that can be left behind after these supernova explosions are called neutron stars. And they're so dense that they basically are nothing but atomic nuclei just crammed together. This is a bizarre thing, because in everyday life, Atoms are not atomic nuclei clamped, crammed together. Atomic structures are really nuclei, and then these atom, and then the electrons are way far out from where the nuclei are. So atoms packed together in a normal solid are really mostly empty space. The nuclei are not up against each other. It's the electrons that are against each other. But in these neutron stars, that's not what's going on. It's almost it's as if the nuclei themselves, nuclei themselves are all crammed together. 
And it's an extremely, extremely dense structure. And what stops those things from collapsing even more, remember they're very, very dense, so they have a lot of gravity. They want to compact and compact and compact. But there are forces associated with the nuclei that keep them from being compacted. But at some point, if you get enough mass crammed in that final object, there's nothing, there's no force in nature that we know of that can stop that collapse, and the thing will just keep collapsing to a runaway collapse to something that's effectively infinitely dense. And that's what we're talking about with these black holes. Um, and so we think that if something more massive than about two and a half times the mass of the sun is left over after a supernova explosion, that thing will eventually collapse into a black hole. And it's so dense, um, in fact, the singularity is in some such a thing as being infinitely dense. All this mass is crushed within something infinitely small. It's so dense that it's such a strong gravitational field that light cannot escape their environment. <clears throat> One of the ways to think about what would happen as an object get denser and denser and denser, imagine on the surface of a planet that was very massive, or the surface of a, you know, uh, of a, a dead star that was very dense, you had a flashlight pointing straight up. If flashlight's pointed straight up, you're going to expect the light just to go off like that. If you just turn it a little bit to the side, the light will begin to bend off. And as you make this thing denser and denser and denser, a light, in principle, can begin to orbit <clears throat> around the star in much the same way that a satellite would orbit around the Earth. And eventually, um, as you increase that mass, uh, even flashlights that are pointed straight up, their light will not escape, and the light will get bent back around. And this idea, uh, there's a radius within which nothing can escape, and this radius is called the Schwarzschild radius, and it's after this guy Schwarzschild who did the first general relativistic calculation to show that such objects could exist. Um, the, the surface that's defined by this radius is called the event horizon. It's a fancy name, so I thought I would use it in a sort of cool-sounding name, the event horizon. Um, and that's the idea. And interestingly, the radius of this, the radius, if you wanted to think of how big the black hole is, um, a nice way to characterize it is by the radius of this event horizon, this Schwarzschild radius. And that's the radius within which light can never get out. So if you go in within that radius, you're never coming out. Okay, so that's the, that's the event horizon of the black hole. And that's something to think about as the edge of the black hole. So if there was a radius of a black hole, that's what would be it. And this is a relationship that shows you how big that is. So for example, if you have a black hole, that's the mass of the sun. Its event horizon is three kilometers. So its radius is only three kilometers, even though it weighs the same as the sun. And the sun, again, remember, is a hundred times the size of the Earth, so it's a lot, lot bigger than three kilometers. So it's like taking the sun and scrunching it down into a, a volume that's tiny, tiny, small. <clears throat> Are there any questions about that? How long did black holes last? Um, so the first order answer is that they last forever. Um, and the reason why I say that is there's nothing to break them apart. You know, they, they exist, and they're so dense and so impregnable that they just last forever. Now, we think, actually, that that's not entirely true, that there's an additional effect uh, that's called Hawking radiation. It's, again, a name, named after Stephen Hawking. That black holes actually um, can slowly, slowly leak mass. So they have some mass, and that mass is slowly leaking out. And the way they leak out, the way that mass leaks out, it has to do with the quantum mechanical phenomenon. And that there, there are things that are going on at the edge of the black hole where um, some particles... Basically, a little bit of energy is stolen from the black hole and leaks out as a stream of, of particles, and it's a quantum mechanical effect. If you want me to talk to you more about that quantum mechanical effect, I can do so. But I think that um, some of it might not be the best use of my time right now. Anything else? Um, so there are a few example problems that I've thrown up here on the lecture that I'm not going to go through now, but 
Jin Ru will talk to you, will go through examples like this in discussion section uh, tomorrow. And they're just simple example problems that ask questions like, um, if you had something that was the mass of Jupiter, uh, how, how large would, would its event horizon be? What would the radius of that black hole be? So if you had some little black hole that was the same mass as Jupiter, how big would it be in terms of its Schwarzschild radius or event horizon? And the answer to this is it's about three meters. So if you had something as massive as Jupiter and it was a black hole, its event horizon would only be three meters across. So, you know, you could be within a mile of it and you wouldn't really notice it other than its gravity. You have to get very, very close to it to actually feel the effects, um, you know, the, this black holeness of it. I probably mentioned to this, you, you guys this before, but if you had a scenario where suddenly the sun were replaced by a black hole that weighed the same as the sun, what would happen to the Earth? Okay? And what would happen to the Earth is not that much, except that it would get very cold. The okay? sun would turn off, it would be dark, it would get very dark, eight minutes later, and then it would get very cold. But the Earth would just keep going around. Because the gravity that the Earth feels really wouldn't change that much at all. It's only if you get very, very close to that black hole would funky things happen or you would really notice the fact that it was a black hole and sucking in everything that was around it or whatever. So this idea that black holes could exist, you might, ask, you might ask yourself, well, if they're black, then how do we find them? That is, if they're truly black holes, and that means they're not emitting any light at all, so they don't shine, how do we find them there? And I've already talked to you about one idea. One idea is you, you look at stars orbiting around them, and I showed you a movie of that. Uh, being done at the center of the galaxy. Another way that people try to look for these black holes is if these black holes are in regions of galaxies that have a lot of gas and stuff like that around them, that gas will tend to be attracted to it. And it will begin orbiting around it at really high speeds. And before it goes into the event horizon, it gets so hot that it will glow. And we can, we can determine how much energy is coming out of this gas and from that figure out how massive the thing is that it's orbiting around. And that's what this is supposed to depict. Um, so the gas can emit X-rays and gamma rays. And so a good way to look for black holes, to detect the presence of black holes, is to actually study galaxies or nearby systems using X-ray telescopes and gamma ray telescopes. It turns out radio telescopes are also very useful. Um, this is a gamma ray image of this object that's called Cygnus X1 and shown right here. And we think that this object is a disk of material that's accreting around a, a black hole. And it's glowing this bright gamma ray image. It's showing you a picture of a black hole. Um, so this black hole that I, that I talked to you about in the center of the galaxy, um, it's a very different kind of black hole than the ones I've just been introducing to you, these sort of one solar mass ones, these black holes that weigh about the same as a, as a star, as a sun. The black hole at the center of the galaxy, does anyone remember how massive it is, roughly? A million, a few million times the mass of the sun. So there are this other whole class of black holes that's totally different than the ones that form at the, at the end of stellar evolution that we think exist in the centers of most galaxies. And these are called supermassive black holes because they're supermassive. Okay. Um, and these, the giant black hole at the center of the galaxy, like I said, is about 4 million times the mass of the sun. And we think that these things exist in the centers of other galaxies in the universe. And here are some images of other galaxies in the universe that people have studied. This rainbow that you see right here is a detection using Doppler shift of gas orbiting around the center of a galaxy. And these things are something like a billion times, or at least a few hundred million times the mass of the sun. So even a thousand times yet bigger than the, than the, than the big black hole in the center of our galaxy. There are black holes that are a billion times as massive as the sun, that live in the centers of really massive galaxies. How these, galaxies, how these black holes got there and um, why they're there and how they affected the galaxies that they live within 
is again another current topic of research. We know that they're there, and a lot of people think that they are they're the original origin, those seeds of those black holes formed along with the very first stars that formed in the universe, which we think were extremely massive, like super duper big stars, they formed super big black holes, and then those black holes grew and grew and grew as the universe evolved, eating up everything around them, and eventually got really big. Um, and so another thing that's very interesting is we've come to understand that the mass of the black hole that exists in the centers of galaxies tends to correlate with how massive the galaxy is itself in almost a one-to-one -one way. And you might think this is natural and that if you have galaxies, and in fact specifically the, bulge, the bulgy region of galaxies, the spheroidal district mass of stars and galaxies, that correlates very well with the mass of the black hole. So our Milky Way has a little puny bulge, and that's why its supermassive black hole is big, but it's not big compared to other supermassive black holes. And there are other black holes in the universe, there are other galaxies in the universe that are super duper big balls of stars, and they tend to host super duper big black holes. And we know that this is true. This is a relation that's been discovered within the last 15 years or so. And um, like I said, we have some ideas about why this is the case but we don't know exactly why this is the case. But it seems to be a hint. There's something fundamental about these black holes that um, helps make galaxies or helps construct galaxies in the way, in the way they are. Are there any questions about that? OK. Now, before I, the last thing I want to talk about when I talk about black holes are, are related subjects. Um, there's a phenomenon in astrophysics known as quasars. I wonder if people have heard the word quasar before. Okay. Does anyone know what they are? Any rough idea what they are? Okay. That means this is a great name. Whoever named quasars had a great name because it's a name that sticks in your head. You have no idea what it is. You're just like, but I know that's a cool name. Um, so, what are quasars? So quasars are extremely luminous objects. And um, they're so bright that in many times they outshine whole galaxies of stars. And what we think they are now is they're active, the active centers of galaxies themselves. The very central regions of galaxies themselves tend to harbor these black holes. And certain times those black holes start eating up lots and lots of stuff. And in the process of all that stuff coming down and being eaten by the black hole, it emits all kinds of energy. Okay. So you see this sort of field right here of star, of, of what looks like stars, but there's actually a lot of galaxies in there. And there's a little region here that if you study it with the Hubble Space Telescope, there's a galaxy here and there's a galaxy here. And that bright star-looking thing right at the center of that galaxy um, is a quasar. You see that? These are two galaxies interacting. And that bright thing in the center of that galaxy is a quasar. It's all this light that's coming from the center of that galaxy that's very, very, very far away. And it's so bright that it looks like a nearby star. And quasar stands for quasi-stellar object, because when they were first discovered, people thought that they were stars, or something like stars. And we think one of the things we think is going on is we think one of the things that triggers this quasar activity is when galaxies start to merge with each other. That funnels a lot of gas towards the center where that black hole is, and that makes and that gas gets hot and starts to shine. Um, so quasars are very, very bright central regions of galaxies. And when they were first discovered, this is before there was like things like Hubble Space Telescope to take these images to show that they lived in galaxies. They were just shown as they just were things that looked like stars. They looked like point sources in the sky, and they were very bright. Uh, but they also were associated with radio waves, and people weren't sure. And so they were called quasi-stellar radio sources. They're quasi-stellar because they looked like just little point sources of light, like stars. And they had radio with them, and so people called, rather than calling them quasi-stellar radio sources, they called them quasars for short. In 1963, Martin Schmidt, who's a quite famous astronomer, used what was then the biggest telescope in the world. So now the biggest telescope in the world was 200 inches in diameter, twice as big as the telescope that Hubble used. And he was able to show that these things have redshifts, but they had redshifts that were really, really fast. 
So it was this. There were all these sort of weird stars in the galaxy that had radio sources associated with them, but they were moving away from us at extreme speeds. So now what we know is going on is these are actually not stars in the galaxy at all, that they're actually the central regions of very, very distant galaxies that look like they're receding from us at really high speeds because they're just expanding with the rest of the expansion of the universe. So, um, so the Schmitt's quasars were something like 2 billion light years away. So for a long time, they were by far the most distant objects that were detected. So the things that were the farthest, farthest away from the universe was as big as it could be. Are there any questions about that? about those objects. So these are sort of other beacons of distant black holes in the universe that shine with these great, these great luminosities. Any questions? Okay. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I want to actually take a pretty firm break, so I'm going to be talking about something totally different. I'm going to now start talking about the age of the universe and how we know how old the universe is. So let me just, let's just break for five minutes. You can leave, you can check your email or do whatever, and we'll be back in five, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>